Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to this episode of Construction Business Management. In this course, we are looking at what it takes to build and develop a construction business. More recently, our videos have been focusing in on sales and marketing. So the last few videos have been uh, had a bent towards uh, marketing your business and selling and today's uh, session is on selling in fact we're going to be looking at how to make sales in order to increase the profits from your construction business i like to use sort of the the tagline think smarter faster better how can we do this in a much more efficient way that we have really thought the process through and there really is five steps to sales and making more sales uh, we kind of talked about six steps in the last one, but one of them also includes uh, follow-up and increasing the return of existing clients. We're going to dive into it in much more detail uh, today and um, try to see if we can sort of really get this to resonate with you. Because as I mentioned in the previous video, in order to be successful in construction, you have to have the clients. No clients, no money, no sales, no profit no business so it is a very important element there's a lot of important elements to construction but this is also one of the fundamental ones because right off the bat you've got nothing to do you've got nothing to mess up right some of the other elements are running an effective project meeting your time and budget requirements well guess what if you didn't make a sale you don't have to worry about all that because you got nothing to do uh, so the sale is very important and having a good process that is going to win you clients for the long term is equally important. It's not about quick turnarounds. It's about really providing a service to your clients. So as we mentioned in the previous video, there are these steps that we can look at uh, from initial contact and inspection. And we'll talk about each one of these, presenting the estimate, negotiating the contract, and I'm going to do a separate video on just the sale and negotiation, understanding the client and understanding some negotiation uh, techniques such as uh, BATNA and a few other ones, a balanced approach developed by William Urry. But we'll do that in another video. But we'll just uh, scratch the surface on the negotiating aspect today. Uh, performing the work, follow-up, service, and warranty. You know, you have to know who your client is, as we've been sort of stating before. If it's a, a family, then you, then you need to know that. And you need to know um, their background and what it is that they're really seeking. If it's another business, you need to know that. And what are they really seeking? So under that fundamental understanding that we've talked about in previous videos becomes really important. Now, if you haven't seen the previous videos or lectures, I would encourage you to go back and look at them. If you click the subscribe button uh, and look under the playlist Construction Business Management on my channel, you'll see all the listings. And I'll also include links in the description below. Okay, so we'll get started here and we'll look at initial contact and inspections. As I said, it's broken up into these five areas and it really is your opportunity to make the first impression with the client so this is your your golden opportunity and there's a lot said you know you only have one chance to make a first impression well this is very true in this section especially when we talk about construction you know in the construction business uh it's a hard business uh, we often get fairly dirty we sometimes uh, don't look that professional our vehicles can get uh, uh, pretty dirty and that sort of thing and we show up on on a customer's uh, office or home and we're kind of all uh, muddy and covered in concrete that's not going to leave a very good uh, first impression so we have to consider our appearance and a big thing about uh, finding out about the customer or the client is how did they find out about us? We talked about advertising in a previous video. What's working? The only way you're ever going to know what's working is if you ask, by the way, how did you find out about me? That's very important because if you know how they found out about you, then that's one advertising area you probably don't want to get rid of because it seems to be working. It's providing you with leads. If you don't ask, you won't know. Uh, and it's surprising often people don't ask you want to definitely know somebody maybe referred you it also kind of tells you when they tell you where they heard about you from also it kind of gives you an indication of the likelihood that you can 
turn that into a sale. It's just a little bit of feeder information. Um, for example, if somebody just kind of Googled your name and it just came up, that's okay, that's good. But if a, a client that you did a lot of work for uh, referred you to this person and this person is close to that client, they're neighbors with that client, or they work in the same company as that client, that's a very strong referral and recommendation. I've always found that those kind of links tend to lead to much higher likelihoods of being able to close the, the deal. You know, you don't know, it could be that somebody is just wanting to get another price to verify that the other contractor that they really want to do the work uh, is not too expensive. So that might be all they're looking for. And so it's harder, it's not impossible, but it's harder for you to make that sale. So it also gives you that kind of feedback to tell you because we are all in this business often really um, stuck for time. And uh, sometimes we have to look at, well, I've got 10 leads right now to follow up on. With everything else I've got on the go, I might only be able to follow up with five of them. Well, it helps you if you can narrow that down to the five that is most likely to turn into actual sales. Uh, and so you're, you're kind of doing a qualification screening uh, very early on to determine is this going to be worth following up on or maybe there's a way that I can add value to this client Maybe I can refer another contractor that's not as busy at this moment or maybe they're not looking at my exact services Maybe they want like really a, a trade partner services. So maybe one of my trade partners I can uh, associate them and refer them to them and that way it's kind of if I, if I do that often enough then you know, it's kind of like play it forward and it just, whatever whatever it is, it tends to come back um, to you in a, a positive way. I mentioned the aspect of give and, give and, give and take in a previous lecture and uh, can't be all take and no give and that givers tend to do the best overall. So even if this lead doesn't seem like it's a good lead for you, doesn't mean it might not be a good lead for somebody that you work with or associate with. And so it's always helpful when you help others and you have the opportunity to help others. And it sort of lays the groundwork for future uh, things that just happen to come back. That's what I've always found. So keep that in mind as well when we're talking about um, prospect information. I would also make sure that you start to keep a database of these leads and you know the, a lot of different ways that you can work with clients today you can keep them informed you can have uh, newsletters you can have blogs that's why everybody wants your name and email whenever you contact them whenever you go to a website uh, they offer you something but then they want they'll email it to you through um, that link and then of course they're asking you to subscribe to uh, their updates. Well, that's one way that a business can actually uh, keep in close contacts with the leads because this time might not have been right, but the next time could be. But let's keep on a more positive note that this is actually a good um, lead. So we just want to find out that background of why uh, they contacted us. Now we do want, as I mentioned, qualify the client. It's not only are they want the type of work that we specialize in, it's also do they seem like the type of individual that we would work well with? Uh, do we think that there might be some issues working with this potential um, client? You know what, you can Google people's names today and you'd be amazed at what you find out about their backgrounds. Uh, so that could be one, one aspect. You just wanna make sure that you're not gonna be uh, working with this particular company or this particular individual if they're unscrupulous or if they're not really serious about the work uh, or they're, you know, they're just fishing for information because your time is valuable. That's why I said um, smarter, faster, better at the beginning. Uh, it's really trying to figure out, well, which are the leads that are most likely you can make. I'm not saying to disqualify a lot here, but sometimes you can have a certain inkling about a client that's not really good for you. I remember uh, years ago, um, and we had this uh, architect that we worked with and the architect was very good uh, uh, to work with. And um, uh, she had uh, given us a, a project to uh, bid on. And so 
we'll talk about testimonials and that sort of thing in a minute, but we had a project that we had recently completed. I think I mentioned in the previous video, uh, the owner of Ray Gordon Equipment, and you know, he was kind enough to let certain uh, uh, people come and check out the work that we'd done on their house after it had just been completed. So that that was almost like a sales location for us. You know, we brought two or three different clients there, potential clients, and we brought this one client that we were pricing the job for the architectural firm and it was a very big job. So I don't know if in today's dollars it, for a residential job, it was a very big job, not for a business to business. But I would say in today's dollars, it would probably be a couple of million dollars. And we brought the client there. Uh, this was the first I'd met the wife a number of times and the wife seemed very good, very like very easy to work with, uh, you know, but then the husband like he was really 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 detailed and i remember because this was about to be quite honest this was about the best work that we had done and so i know what we were capable of but there was this tiny little hammer mark on a piece of baseboard that was behind a door and it caught his eyes and before i knew it he was on his knees pointing to this how could something like this happen and i thought to myself i could just see how his expression was i thought to myself I do not want to work for this individual. I just, it just turned me off the whole um, project. I did not, I wanted to make sure I got a price in with the consultant because they needed to have the prices in, but I priced it at such a high rate that, uh, you know, we could put up with that kind of uh, stuff. So I really priced it, trust me, high enough that I would not get the project, which meant it didn't take me that much time to really do it from that, that stake on that point on already invested enough in it to begin with and it was interesting because I said we were pretty uh, good friends with the uh, consultant and architect and she told me about six months later that the project was in litigation uh, it had no end of problems with the contractor was fine but it was the client so um, you definitely want to um, qualify your clients you do not want to work with everyone because it can be such a uh, sideline to um, your focus on being more successful um, in your business. I also had I had a client too, just to give a little bit of background, because I think this point, it, it doesn't get explained enough with construction uh, business courses and uh, business management aspects. There's some projects, again, I'll emphasize it, that you don't want to do. Now, again, I'm talking about a small percentage that it would be in your segment. Obviously, if it's completely out of your segment, you probably don't want it because you're probably bidding on it, but you're not competitive. Uh, but if it's in your segment and there's a client that you uh, can pick up on, that's great. But I'll be honest, there's clients out there that are smarter than that and they don't give off those clues necessarily, even though you try to see if there's anything there just by your questioning. You know, I'm a big proponent of lean construction and we talk about the five whys and digging deeper to find the root cause of things. But questions is a very powerful tool. And so I had a client and they were a referral from a really good client as well. Another really good client that I really uh, enjoyed working with. Uh, but and they, we got the, we got the architect's drawings and everything. Didn't know the architect uh, and uh, very nice individual you know, showed us that we were the highest price, but because we were referred by another contractor, I think we were about $20,000 high on the, on the project, but wanted to give it to us because of the referral and was very nice to, uh, at the beginning. And then we got the project and it was like a different person. It was a different person. It wasn't the same person. They were too smart. Like they knew how to make sure that they got you in. They wanted a really good contractor. And then from that day forward, they were trying to get the 20,000 plus back. And it was very difficult to work with. And I think the person was very difficult um, to live with. One, at one point, the wife had made a um, change order and it signed off on it and wanted this and this done. And he went through the roof and the wife was actually there when he went through the roof. You don't listen to her. You listen to me. And so then I had to deal with them not talking for probably the next six weeks or so on the project. And so I had, they had their own conflict going and, you know, this sort of tyrantal person. Uh, so could I have figured that one out? I don't think so. He's very, he's very smart individual. Um, surprisingly, we did get through it. And again, I try to be professional. 
step by step you try to be professional with it and you try to deal with it the best way you can you do not want to get into litigation and things like that because it's 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 nobody's really going to win uh in cases like that and to be honest in a court system you really have to have good documentation uh, to be able to beat a client uh, in most cases. Not that you can't, because I spend a lot of time teaching that too in my other courses, project management. That's why you want to have good documentation so you can do that. But that's like a last resort. And so, you know, I said they were like a little bit of a tyrant, but at the end of the day, they weren't somebody that, that wouldn't pay somebody. They at least would pay somebody, but they were very good at negotiating hard deals a hard negotiator and that's why i'm going to spend a little bit of time in another video talking about negotiation hard negotiator and hard on family hard on contractors same all the way through but we did get through working with them surprisingly this individual actually uh referred us to a number of other um people um so uh it is it is an interesting uh story how uh, the world works that way but i can tell you if you if you don't get into that it's a lot less stressful uh, so there should be building up some skills at trying to qualify the time of the client so that you waste less time and you get into less adversarial relationships. You can do what you do best. You focus in on what your skill set is and you try your best to add value to that client. Uh, so if the client's serious and they um, the client's serious and they seem like they want to do the work, they seem like somebody that you could work with on a professional basis. That's great. And otherwise, maybe it's best to just pass on it and not to bid on that particular project. Uh, so your view of the client, you know, some of the things too that I would mention uh, for or with uh, your view of the client uh, further is um, if they can have us like this is where uh, I mentioned also in a previous video, you know, you can you can sell uh, sell small to build big. So if they don't have a set of drawings, if you can get them to the stage where you get your designer. So this is where you either have really good partnerships or relationships with an architectural firm or you have an architectural technologist that you work with where you do design and build. And what you do is you charge them for the design. If they want to get other bids, then they can. But hopefully through that process of design, they're going to want you to do the project. You know, so somebody else is going to have to be really stellar to somehow get it away from you. That dramatically increases your ability to close the project if you're really good on those early stages with the client. And a lot of uh, smaller contractors, they get very good at that. It ups their percentage of closings dramatically. Uh, so if you get them to do a set of drawings, if they haven't already got them, if, they have, if they've already paid to have a set of drawings done, it means they're serious. They're going to do this work. As long as uh, the budget is within their, their means, they're going to do the work. Some projects uh, you can actually do and you can, um, you know, as I said with that Michael Upshell from Pro, uh, Pro Built Homes, I sell small so I can build big, right? Uh, which uh, makes a, a lot of sense. You build a good relationship, you provide a quality design and you build trust with the client and now they want you to do the work and then you execute on that work and then they refer you to more people and then when they move or they do something else, they want you to do it and that, grows and grows and grows it's a compounding effect over time uh, so all of those things will help you position yourself um, to uh, be more likely to close um, the project and it also will separate somebody that's serious or not serious if they're not willing to get a design then why should you spend a couple of weeks trying to uh, come up with an estimate when they're not serious about it right uh, so it tells you gives you some pretty good information plus for you to be able to come up with an estimate, you have to need you need a solid set of drawings so that they can compare apples to apples so that when they're getting other bids, they're all based on the same thing. So that's important for you too. So you don't want to be estimating things that are not likely to happen. Preparation. You know, you can give ballpark prices to things, square foot based prices, but say that it really can't be um, accurate until you have the full set of drawings completed, uh, working construction drawings, uh, then we're ready to go. Preparation. Uh, if you're going to go visit, go prepared. You know, what are you going to be inspecting? Do you need a flashlight? Do you need uh, testing tools? Do you need an extension ladder? 
Uh, do you need a, a drone uh, that you can uh, video whatever is up higher? You know, all of these things are available today and you should make sure that you come equipped. Don't come to the client site and start asking, do you have a step ladder or something or uh, a flashlight when you should have that stuff? You want to come across professionally uh, and park your car very, you know, don't drive up halfway on the lawn. Don't be late. If you're late for an appointment that you've got with a client, not likely you're going to close on that deal. Unless you got stuck with something and you gave them plenty of notice that uh, could you move the time frame. But if you actually show up late in the day and age of instant communication, you really don't have a very good excuse. And so it shows that you're not respecting their time right from the get go. So I certainly wouldn't do uh, business with somebody that, that's coming in late like that. Because uh, it's really sort of, well, if they're like that now, what are they going to be like when they actually get the project? Uh, so they're really setting the expectations. My expectations at that point is uh, I wouldn't give the job to somebody if I was the client. So make sure you have promotional materials. Now, I don't know that flyers and that sort of thing is, is of any use uh, today. Really, what I would try to do is I would be sending them a link to my web page if I have... Uh, other places that ha I show my uh, product, if I've had uh, newspaper items, whatever, testimonials on my web page, I would be wanting to prep them so that they've seen that by the time I come in the door, they've looked at the portfolio, and if they haven't, maybe I've got an iPad Pro or something, the large one, and I can quickly show them and I can tell them, I can send them the link again, etc. Uh, I think that's a pretty good way to um, walk through it, right? Uh, so should have your company profile, uh, whatever credentials you have. Again, you're working to professionalize yourself. If you're a member, as we mentioned in a previous video of a construction association, uh, anything like that, that helps to professionalize yourself, especially the associations, you know, where they vet their members. Uh, I remember with uh, Bill, Building Industry and Land Development Association, they would always send around who wanted to be a new member in case there was something somebody knew that they could investigate to make sure that this person, they want above board professionals. They don't want to be represented by somebody that's kind of uh, shady. That would not work because the whole association works on the fact that if you're a member of that association, it means you're credible. It means you're trustworthy. And that's a big deal in construction, as I mentioned earlier. Construction, unfortunately, there's a lot of fly-by-night and shady characters in the construction industry. So you need to make that client believe you're not one of them, that you're professional. Uh, so all of these things come together um, that way and helps you um, to provide that. Now, if you get the jobs, make sure that you ask for a testimonial. If they're satisfied, make sure that you ask people to say that you're satisfied. Uh, take photographs of all your work at the various stages. For the documentation purpose that I mentioned earlier, for the selling purpose, you can show how clean your site is kept during construction at the different phases. You can come up with a system that you use, name it something, and market that system as something that's um, unique to your construction business. Always ask your clients for a testimonial. Some of them say, oh, I don't know exactly what you want. Provide them a template. Make it easy for them. Rough it out if you need to, um, but get a testimonial. The other thing I found was occasionally when I would ask for a testimonial, I remember one client, the, and I thought the client was extremely happy with the work, and they seemed like they were upset. And I said, oh, is something wrong? And they said, well, actually there is. You know, when uh, uh, um, we were out uh, working, uh, we came home and they had a four-year-old and uh, we had the plumber in that particular day. So I knew exactly because they told me who it was. Uh, and it was a fairly large job. And uh, the four-year-old ran up to um, the mother and said, mommy, mommy, how the and swore are you? Right. And where does the kid learn how to swear? The plumber upstairs swearing up and down because something wasn't going well and the kid, the four-year-old, picks up on that word that they never heard before and then they say to 
uh, the mother that word, right? And so that was good feedback, actually. I would have never gotten that feedback otherwise. So then we had to put in some protocols with our trade partners to make sure that that would never happen. And if it did happen, then we would start looking for other trade partners, quite frankly, because you, you lost potentially that client for future jobs because of one action of one employee of one trade partner. You lost the future work of that client because of one action by one trade partner's employee. Now think about the supply chain we have in construction. There's a lot of opportunities for people that you hire to do work to spoil it. And that goes for business to business relationships. Say you're working for a uh, college institution and you're doing uh, office work or you're doing classroom work. And again, you could have the same thing with one of your trade partners and that could muck up the whole thing of this multi-million dollar relationship that you've built over a 10 year period that could put it in jeopardy. So you've got to watch your business. You work hard to develop your business. You've got to watch the people that come and go and you've got to make sure that they understand if they want to build their businesses through working with your business that you have certain rules and those rules cannot be broken. A similar example, I remember I was sitting on my front lawn and I remember the landscapers uh, just uh, for the house uh, on the other corner from me. Uh, I remember this, this truck showed up with these landscapers and they had this huge, huge stereo, you know, uh, system and they had it on full blast, full blast, because I guess to hear it over the lawnmowers, <laughs> they had this stereo. And so one of the neighbors across the street uh, asked them if they could shut it, shut it off. And the guy started swearing at him. The landscaper started swearing at him. Nobody tells me to shut up. So, of course, the neighbor told the neighbor that had hired them what happened and the neighbor that hired them fired them right away. So that one employee of that landscaping company, maybe the landscaping company was okay, they just had different crews, but that employee blew it for that uh, company. So again, we'll talk about in a future class too, who you hire and making sure that you hire the best people for the job because that's the kind of jeopardy, all this hard work that you put in, that's what could result, how it could result if you're not careful. So yes, testimonials are very, very helpful. Um, for um, those reasons, as I mentioned, right? And it gives you that opportunity for the continuous improvement aspect here at the bottom. Um, as I say, the lean construction way of thinking, continuous improvement. How do we constantly, you don't get that kind of feedback if you don't ask. And then again, having satisfaction surveys at the end of your projects is also very important. Here's an example I took. Uh, I had been involved, as I mentioned before, with a construction of one of the buildings at the college that I work for, George Brown College, where I'm a professor. And uh, this uh, building, the waterfront campus, I, not, I wasn't involved in this particular building, the construction. I was the lead as far as for students uh, access to it during construction. But I was involved with e-building up at the Casa Loma campus, where I was project manager for technology. But um, this was a building that was built. Uh, the e building that was built, it kind of had some issues. And so that contractor wasn't the preferred contractor for future work, although that contractor was a, a decent enough contractor, a contractor. But at that time, you know, if you let one project go, then you lose some clients. Um, so in this particular project, uh, Alice Dawn uh, performed the work and they were able to actually uh, get it done, you know, really within the budget, within the time frame, in a very, very busy time, in a very, very busy street, as a very, very busy um, uh, time period, and uh, a lot of uh, industry, not industry, government uh, relations and support that was put into the development of this building. So they were actually um, able to come through. So this was the project manager that was acting for facilities on this particular building. And they made this comment uh, because what does Zeliston do? They ask for testimonials, they put them on their webpage. Makes sense, right? So ICI, residential, whatever, you should get testimonials, especially when you've got a client like this that is a very, very high profile client in the city of Toronto, uh, one of the premier colleges in the province. So it's going to, um, it's, a, it's 
a positive uh, statement when you have a client like that that's saying positive things about you. So they said the performance of the Elliston team under these challenging construction conditions was exemplary. It's right on the lake, all kinds of um, uh, dewatering issues and complexity involved with the project. Much of the construction documentation process was done on a contractor design assist basis. What I meant to say earlier was it was built on a very tight timeline because there was the, just after the 2008 financial crisis, there was this opportunity for shovel in the ground ready projects to get funding. And, but you had to have it completed in a very tight window uh, governmentally and contractually. So that was a lot of pressure. So they really came through. And Elliston's leadership, flexibility, and response time, time has proven to be the key reason we have remained on track and on budget. And it did finish that way. And then the next project, because this project went so well, you know who the preferred contractor was, same company, and they got that project. So those are how those interconnections happen. Now, this is what I was saying earlier, that this involves a lot of complexity, a lot of technical aspects of the building process. But there's the other side, there's the relationship process. So you actually have to come through with what you promise when you're in the original signing of the contract stages. And then if you do come through, then that's going to lead to that opportunity for more work, repetitive work, especially with big clients like in the ICI sector. So providing advice. Well, that's the other thing. Whenever you're involved in these projects, you you are being asked a lot of questions. And also, you are finding out things that maybe wasn't in the original contract uh, or you're bidding on the original contract and you see things, why isn't this here? This should actually be upgraded because right now's the time to do it. If you don't upgrade it now, it's going to cost like three times as much three or four years from now. Why wouldn't you do it now? And it'll be less disruptive. It'll be better for you, etc. But you have to make sure that the advice you're giving is not self-serving. So I didn't want to lead you the wrong way when I talked about in the previous videos about upselling. Well, yes, you are upselling, but you're upselling value to the client, value to the client, right? And if you built trust with them, that will have a very positive um, take from the client. If they feel that you are not um, doing it for the right reasons, then that's the that's a problem because now they're losing trust in you. And it's very hard once you get trust, once you lose trust, to get the trust back. So you definitely don't want to seem pushy with it uh, and you don't want to get carried away and you definitely don't want to gouge on it. Really, if, if you're providing advice for an extra, if you're in the project, then we could talk about change order and change order processes. You just want to make sure you've itemized and clearly costed things out and you can walk through it and you feel uh, quite competent with those numbers that you can explain them. And usually they are fairly high because there are changes. And once you get changes in a, into even a, a drawing before you start the work, although that's the best time and that's where the least cost is, uh, that is uh, more expensive. And so you definitely want to be able to walk them through so that they have trust in you. And that makes selling and negotiating that much easier. When somebody trusts you, it's a lot easier to sell to them than when they don't trust you. So honesty is the best policy. There's so many unscrupulous people out there. Uh, it's, um, it's really amazing. I, usually, it's, well, very often when it's something outside my scope of what I want to do, you know, on my own place or whatever, and I get somebody. Uh, I very often sort of let my wife um, sort of ask a lot of the questions. I'm watching to see what they're, what they're saying. I'm trying to figure out, do I trust them, right? So she's a, my wife's a professional negotiator, so she's really good on this stuff. And I'm pretty good at, obviously, on the construction side. Uh, what the person is up to. And so it's always uh, a little bit of uh, fun in there. Um, and of course, make sure if you're, if you're being called in to look at something, look at it really carefully and take lots of photos. Sometimes when you get away from it, then ideas come to your head. But if you've already taken a few videos and photos of it, then you can always check it out when you're away from the project. If you've then done your takeoffs, put together your estimate, right? Um, can you justify it? 
right? It, there's no point spending two weeks, three weeks putting together an estimate to not be able to get the work. Uh, so you don't want to just be highballing all your projects because you're not going to get very much work. Uh, so you want to know what your costs are, what your direct costs are. And we've done this in the financials. That's the estimating part. And then you want to know what your overhead costs are. And then you want to know what your profit target is. And you want to make sure you've allocated for those and you can justify any questions that may come up. And you want to make sure that you set the right expectations, something that you can deliver upon. Uh, so setting the right expectations is very important. So that means maybe certain materials, you might want to qualify the benefits and disadvantages and advantages so they know what they're getting. Uh, so really understanding uh, where that person is coming from and putting yourself in their shoes and what kind of questions they might be asking of you and making sure you're prepared for them. Also, it is important that if there's something missing in the drawings and you see it, tell them. All right. They can always put out a. They can always put out an addendum if it's being uh, bid upon, uh, so that everybody bids on the same thing. If I'm a client and you pointed out something that you think is missing or incorrect, and nobody else does, all of a sudden I'm thinking, how is it this contractor sees that and the other two con contractors never said anything? It seems to me they're more on the ball. That's a plus for you in getting that project potentially. Uh, Clients should be briefed on errors, like I said, and it will help to build that um, client uh, base because they'll start to have more trust in you and less in the competitors that might be bidding on the project. Negotiating the contract, all right? So I said I'll do a little pull out so I won't spend too much time here, but what I would definitely say is if you're following the points of the Dale Carnegie aspect, putting yourself in the other person's shoes, like in how to win friends and influence people, um, then you kind of know what they need. And if you're developing a price and you're going to be providing them with a price, and this it's not like in a government competitive bid process, you got to just do what it is, right? That's a public tender. You just got to do what that is. But when it's private sector, uh, even whether it's business to business or if it's uh, business to customer, there's opportunities then to offer different options. And that can be really intriguing, not to offer a thousand different options, but if you have like three different options, they might think, yeah, you're too expensive on, on this one uh, line item, uh, this bottom price. But if you have, but option B, hmm, that's intriguing. We never thought about that. Yeah, maybe if we don't do that, that's putting us in our budget range. You know what? Maybe this is a good thing for us to go on. If you never gave them option B, you just they just know they don't want to go with that first price. Okay, next. What's the next one? And somebody else will do it if you don't. So they'll beat you to it. But you got it because you better understood them and you provided an option for them. So... Make sure that that is part of how you set yourself up with op, op, alternate budgets. Also, we'll get into the aspect of determining where's the other person coming from and what kind of negotiator are there and what, what can we do about it. And there's, some, there's a few techniques that I'll talk about when we get into the negotiating part. Performing the work. Well, you better do what you said. So you better show up when you said you're going to show up. You better keep your site clean like you showed in your portfolio. Uh, you better follow through. If you don't, then I'm not happy because you sold me a bill of goods. You said you were going to do X, Y, Z and you're not doing X, Y, Z. Uh, so that's why I mentioned this uh, case study that we looked at in one of the previous videos. If they say they're going to plate your place in one day and that's what the contract is and it takes them a week, I wouldn't be happy. On the other hand, if they do it in a day, I'm very happy. They're satisfying my expectations. So if you have the systems in place to make sure that you're able to come through repeatedly with what you promise, that's going to put you in a very good position to be successful. So yes, arrive in time. You know, where do people smoke? If you have tradespeople that smoke, uh, keep them uh, so that they're not going to be bothering the neighbors, that they're not going to be bothering the uh, people or the business, even the business. Like if it's a business and everybody's smoking just outside the door, make sure that you're following, complying with whatever the municipal requirements are that you deal with because they're all over the map and make sure that it's not going to be um, problematic for your clients or their neighbors. Uh, seems like an easy thing, but it's something that you need to 
um, look at. Garbage. Well, you know, are you keeping the site clean or is it looking like this? Not very nice. Uh, garbage. Do your workers open their car door and drop their coffee cups on the ground and it's on the street then and then the neighbors are all upset? Where are they parking? Is it being, uh, is it blocking somebody's driveway and getting them all upset? There's a lot that you have to think about with regards to how uh, your workers are accessing the site and what they think of the clients. So they've got to think beyond just the actual work itself. We talked about in one of the earlier uh, video lectures, we talked about mission and vision. And we used the example of Mattamy Homes, uh, Canada's biggest production builder. And we said, um, basically, best homeowner experience. Didn't say best home, it said best homeowner experience. You could build the best home and still have a thoroughly ticked off client because you got garbage all over the place. You got people smoking and swearing. Uh, and uh, it's just sort of a chaotic mess. You're not going to get repeat work that way. So failure in just one of them, as I mentioned with the profanity example, is enough to make the client upset enough that they might not want to deal with you again. Well, if you, if you had done all of these things and you negotiated the contract and closed the work and got all of these things completed, well, also make sure that Follow through, close out the project. If there's any minor things left, make sure you finish them. Finish the job, finish it out. These little things that hang on and now you've gone on to another project and there's all these little deficiencies, it's gonna drive the client nuts. So be attentive to finishing them. Finish it, right? Don't start something and not 100% finish it. And if they're contacting you after the fact, make sure that you are very prompt to return their calls. The nice thing is in this industry, people are a disaster in this area. A lot of contractors, not very good at that. So you can stand out. You can be the 20% of contractors that absolutely stand out in responding to clients' needs. And that's gonna to lead to you getting 80% of the clients if we use Pareto as the example. Um, so make sure that you return those um, comments and um, that 80% of your business will be repeat business as has been eloquated many, many times by many, many people. So that's kind of what I wanted to cover today, but I have a couple of questions for you to ponder. Um, follow, I would take a look at, there's this link here that I put and I'll try to put it in the description, but if not, you can also type it in. Uh, which is uh, on um, considerate construction, uh, considerate constructors. I was in the UK, uh, United Kingdom, and they have this program called considerate constructors. And I thought it was a really good idea, at least if you live in a, a really busy urban place, like a Toronto, like a New York, like a Dallas, Texas, and somewhere that's really busy right? And there's a lot of construction going on. Like, I mean, Toronto has no end of construction going on. I think we have the most cranes in North America right now uh, up. Uh, so you know what? Believe it or not, everybody doesn't love construction the way we do that are in the construction business. I love construction. Not everybody loves it. My wife points out to me, look at that. Look at this, all the traffic, this and that. I go, you got to you gotta appreciate it because this is what gave us our, our business here, right? Um, so she, she does. She goes, yeah, you're right. But everybody doesn't think that way. They think they're stuck in traffic. Why? Because of construction. Why? Because of a lane closure so that basically a crane can be bucketing up concrete. Why? Because there, there's dirt everywhere, mud, dust. Somebody's cutting with a quick cut saw and it's making clouds of dust. Uh, all of these things, right? And uh, so there's a lot of people that are building up an intensity. And so when I was in London, England, uh, if you've been to London, England, everything is on a postage stamp, tight, tight streets. It's more busy than um, Toronto for sure. Uh, and uh, I saw these signs everywhere, considerate constructors, considerate constructors. And so I, I got the gist of it. People in London and people, in, so it's from the UK, it's more than just London, but I'm sure London was where it like, got its start, um, are fed up and they're not happy. And with the construction. So there's a group of contractors, not everybody's part of this, but that really work hard, that when they do a project, 
They want to have as little disruption to the community and the neighbors as possible. And so they want to build up a better reputation for the construction industry. I thought it was a great idea. It's something that we should do here. I brought it up at one of uh, our association meetings. This is quite a while back. And I thought they were going to run, run me out of the meeting because it was just another thing to do and they didn't really want to do it. But um, I really think it is an individual company. You could position yourself uh, really well when you are selling um, to clients because clients get wor worried what the the neighbors are going to think if if you're causing disruption that puts pressure on them etc so what do you do about that what are your policies how do you operate that could be a differentiator that really doesn't cost you anything that gives you a competitive advantage over other companies you got to look for these little competitive advantages to help you close the sales and um, that's that's very helpful i would also suggest you visit websites of construction businesses um, that you are thinking of using for in this course a business plan but for yourself in reality if you're going to start a business in construction what uh, construction uh, business are you going to start and how do others market themselves doesn't mean you have to adopt their ideas but it does exactly but it does give you some ideas of how this could be managed and um, put into place for your business so just something to ponder and think about I'm Tom Stevenson wishing you a wonderful day and we'll see you next time oh and don't forget click subscribe Look under the construction uh, manage uh, business uh, business construction business management playlist. Click subscribe and uh, click the notification so you're updated for future videos. Bye for now.